Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I hope you've slept enough. Um, welcome to A Way to Fuzzy Democracy, um, a lecture of the more socialistic part of the uh, Congress. Okay, now you can ask questions later. And um, maybe first um, we'll in introduce ourselves. My name is Svenja Schröder. I'm a student in Duisburg in uh, Germany and I study applied communication and media sciences, which is quite interdisciplinary and is a mix mixture of psychology, sociology and information sciences. And I'm also working at an informatic institute and at a university in Duisburg. And s maybe some words about Christiane. Well, hello. Um, I'm Christiane Rutten and um, maybe some of you know me from yesterday. I had another talk about buffer overflows here. And um, for my background, I uh, studied physics and mathematics in Duisburg. And now I'm earning my living with um, working journalistic for uh, Heise Security. Maybe you know about it. And well, I'm particularly interested in all the systematic and all the informational and that fuzzy stuff we're going to talk about. And let's see what we can make about it. And well, OK. Fuzzy democracy, I mean, you will find that term quite nowhere in literature or on the internet, and it's pretty new. I mean, it's about the idea that modern logic, like one and zero, is very sharp. And there's an approach in mathematics, it's called uh, fuzzy set theory. Um, this approach is much more, well, there, there's, there's more like clouds. It's not fixed points, it's more like clouds. And this is quite the idea behind um, direct democracy as well. Because if you, if you think of participation of everyone uh, in the state or in a community, you have a big cloud of people acting, of elements acting in the system. And that's pretty much the idea behind um, fuzzy mat mathematics as well, and hence the term fuzzy democracy. Well, OK. Um, our first slide, I mean, this is going to uh, be the introduction for the two-parted um, speech we are going to hold. And the first part would be best described with um, the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. Well, I'd like to add something. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's not described. It's something for you to think about. And okay, um, right. this um, quote is quite useless if you've heard the first part of the speech. So maybe you find this um, just as a quote to think about as uh, till we start. Okay. Well, it, it should um, pick you in two directions. What's, what's wrong with democracy? Um, if such intelligent people as uh, Winston Churchill are saying um, these things, I mean. Okay, and the second part, we will be looking at modern communication and how it might change the way we think about and practice politics. So um, the first part will be helped by Svenja. And would you like to tell what it's yes. all about? First, we start with an introduction to democracy, about um, a very brief history of democracy, the idea behind democracy, the obligatory definition of uh, democracy, and so on. Then we'll start to look at the citizens in a state um, as the center of the democratic process. Then far further, we'll look at political participation and frustration and um, then we'll look very briefly at um, yeah, the connection between new media and politics. Well, the second part that I'm going to talk about, it's um, a little bit about system theory and how we can apply to modern systems, uh, state systems and political systems. And as well as information theory, we will, we will make out that information is very much um, responsible for the relations between the elements in a system. And, um, a little primer for fuzzy theory, um, how you can think about it and what you can make of it. And uh, the end will be a little closer look at some interesting projects that we already have, that are already out there and how they can be used and how they are implemented right now um, to make some fuzzy democracy and direct participation. And that will be a quite extensive part of it. So I think. We'll start then. Okay. And then we'll start with democracy. Where does democracy come from? There are um, the Greek um, expressions, which I, I cannot speak Greek, so maybe you just read those cryptic letters. And it comes from demos, 
which means the people and Kratia, I hope I, uh, it's right what I uh, speak here, and um, it um, means power, leadership and strength and you could um, translate it with uh, leadership of the people. So and, um, <coughs> democracy itself could be defined in the following way, there are two parts. First, uh, democracy um, um, describes a government system where the people have the control over the government ruling over them and um, Secondly, it's a more abstract um, democracy is a decision-making process where all participants have the same influence on the voting outcome. It's like could be in your, pff, I don't know, kitchen when you sit uh, around the chair and say, uh, around the table and say, okay, what we're going to eat today. Uh, two say meat, three say vegetable. Okay, then you're going to be vegetarians. Okay, and um, then is democracy equal to democracy? Uh, democracy, and there are very many um, forms of democracy, as you can see on this slide. Um, those forms are not nearly all forms of democracy, and um, we will speak in this lecture of the democracy. But you have to keep uh, in your head that it's not the democracy, but it's but it uh, must be democracies as a uh, plural. Okay, now, now a very brief history of democracy. The first democracy was instituted in Athens. Uh, it's uh, called the Athenian democracy. Okay, <laughs> it, um, later it was instituted also in other polis, which means city-states. Those were those ancient Greek city-states. And um, yeah, it was quite new because, um, well, I'm not so very, very used to uh, ancient history, but um, the, the poor uh, people said, okay, we will also w want to vote and take part in collective decisions. And um, democracy was instituted because there was a need for government gover governance as collective decisions. So um, all citizens could vote, not only the rich, with a restriction that all free and male citizens could vote. For today uh, circumstances, this sounds quite uh, well. Um, what? That sounds quite archaic, I think. Yes, but um, in uh, in ancient Greek, it was quite revolutionary. We could say. Okay, um, this form of democracy, the Athenian democracy, was often criticized because of ostracism. I don't know, I don't think that everybody knows what ostracism is. Um, um, it was a process where um, um, yeah, people could be sent to exile by, um, yes, by voting, so everybody could vote and if somebody should go into exile and if it was more than, let's say, 50%, the person had to go to exile. That's, um, well, not very, Nice, <laughs> okay. So um, in medieval times, there was nearly no dem democratic government in Europe. So it was only in some parts of Swiss and um, other states, but I've, it was no dem democracy in, in a whole um, government in the state. And um, 1787, the American constitution was uh, um, um, was the first democratic constitution and the USA was the first modern democratic state which led to a kind of re revival of democracy. Okay, and let's, uh, come to <coughs> let's come to democracy today. So we have to ask several questions. Is democracy holy? Is it untouchable? And is it the right form of governance? And it seems uh, that gem democracy today is, a la is like a kind of last remaining ethically justifiable modern, modern form of governance. And um, there are no more contrasting government forms since the end of the Cold War and the end of the socialistic states. So we cannot just say socialism is bad and democracy is good, but uh, this is, um, yeah. We have to ask um, if um, we could speak of a decline of the modern 
we, if we can speak of a decline of modern democracies, because um, democracy itself as a government form is maybe not, well, richtig <laughs> umgesetzt. Um, yeah, right. Okay. Yes, the best. Please excuse my English. I'm, uh, I hope you can understand me anyway. <laughs> okay, uh, are there any questions so far, maybe? Okay, good sign. <laughs> so let's come to the idea behind democracy. We'll start with a second quote. Citizen participation is at the heart of democracy. That means that the concrete individual with all its desires, fears, preference and preference and interests is the center of the democratic process, which means all of you uh, are the center of the democratic process and um, not really the majority. As, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And we could speak of two central concepts, <coughs> which means participation of the individual and opposition or veto as last cry for help if you are kind of drowned in um, kind of decision processes um, which concern you and which you didn't have the um, opportunity to take part in. So um, our uh, meaning is that uh, those um, ideas are best um, realized by uh, direct democratic concepts. Okay, then the cr cr criteria of quality or what has a democracy to, de to guarantee? There are four major points. <clears throat> First, uh, democracy has to guarantee the opportunity for participation. Okay, that sounds quite logically because uh, uh, sounds quite logic because um, otherwise it maybe won't be a democracy. And then the basic principle of uh, civil liberty, with, with, which means um, protection from government authority, which is um, <coughs> assured by basic rights and the separation of powers. And um, a second point is the guarantee for autonomous decision making, so nobody can tell you what you have to think or what you have to decide. <clears throat> As a, a third criteria of quality, we have political equality, <clears throat> so that everybody has a fair chance to represent values and interests. <clears throat> I have to drink some Klugmatte. <clears throat> And as a fourth point, we have effective and res uh, an effective and responsible government. And responsive gov responsible uh, government means that it's responsible for you and it has to um, be responsive for your welfare, which means social security, and it has to pre provide safety. <coughs> okay, now we come to criticism at modern democracies. Well, you could... Um, criticize democracy, modern democracies in uh, several ways. Um, first, we have maybe low level of transparency of uh, political processes, then maybe the represent representatives in a representative uh, democracy don't actually represent their voters, which uh, leads to a low trust in politicians, politicians um, concerning their, their decision making and their competence. Then we've got a lot of corruption affairs, which at least uh, you can read in all of the newspapers, which is also maybe part of lobbyism. And um, then we've also got shifting of uh, political public into the mass media and politics as banal media events. Maybe uh, the German um, of you have seen um, Cancel Chancellor Schröder by uh, at Wetten das. It's a kind of TV show in Germany, and uh, it, it was uh, the Chancellor set um, set, uh, set sorry set between all these other all the other prominent people and was kind of uh, yeah political actress as uh, prominent people. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Yes. yes? What? Okay. Uh, 
Uh, just a remark, I think uh, the criticism you uh, yes. told us is not only Chris criticism of modern democracies, but of all democracies, because uh, being corrupted is human. Lobbyism is human. Mm -hmm. That's always been a problem. Okay, I just let this stand in the room and we could make further discussions at the end of the slide. Well, thank you. <clears throat> okay. So we have to ask a question, is democracy wrong? And um, then we have to say, no, democracy as a concept isn't wrong, but modern democracies need to be improved. So there are three approaches for reforms. There's uh, first the reform of bottom-up communication, which means the communication from the citizen to the state very shortly, and it means voting or citizen participation and other kinds. Then there's a kind of reform of lateral communication. This means uh, communication between representative actors and um, kind of reform of uh, top-down communication, a third point, which means um, yeah, top-down communication means uh, from state to the citizen. And you see we've underlined the first point. <clears throat> we think that we have to reform bottom-up communication, communication, which means that democracy, or better said, modern democracies, need to be democra democratized. Yes. <clears throat> So we have to get closer to the original idea to, of democracy, which means we have to um, institute more direct democratic elements. So a second question is, do modern democracies serve the individual or do all governmental decisions just serve the majority? And uh, can the individual influence polit political decisions? So this leads us to the center of the democratic uh, process, the individual or the concrete citizen. <coughs> so I'll introduce you to the citizens. <laughs> the citizens, how do they look like? And we can say that there's a kind of cognitive mobili mobilization since the 50s. If you're uh, interested in media, you know since the 50s, there, um, there is the television, <clears throat> and um, which means, okay, no, other uh, said, since the 50s there were more informational resources, and which means higher level, level of education, and uh, the television as a primary uh, information source, which led to increased political skills, um, generally more interest in political issues and um, in a whole you could say this all led to a political sophistication of the citizens. So, <coughs> so um, citizens have to inform their, themselves actively but they cannot be informed about every political issue. You could maybe see it on yourselves. Um, maybe you know about um, the issue you're interested in but if I ask you, okay, what about maybe whale politics? Do you know anything about this? It's just an example. So you have to say, okay, no, I'm not interested in whale politics. Maybe you are all interested in hacker politics or something like that, security. <coughs> so maybe this was an example. So <coughs> there's the question if there is, uh, whether there is a split into informed and uninformed citizens. Yes. And... Um, in a whole, we could say today the politically informed citizen is a critical citizen. Okay. So, <clears throat> I don't know if you're going to vote in your state or if you participa participate in uh, demonstrations or something like that, but. Um, there are many, there are many um, uh, some questions, which is which are why is the voting rate decreasing or why are so many citizens demonstrating? And um, the central point of uh, this is um, that voters have to think that they can influence policy, and um, if they think that they cannot influence policy, this leads to political frustration. <coughs> 
and um, which means that they feel powerless and not integrated into the political process. So um, this uh, is getting clearer if I explain you the following slides, which leads us to uh, lead us to um, political particip participation. There are several ways of political participations uh, of political participation. Um, which are basically conventional participation and unconventional participation. Conventional participation is uh, institutionalized and unconventional is um, kind of acting out of the system. I'll explain both forms later more detail, more detailed. And you, you could say that uh, citizens concentrate on forms of political participation which are up to their motivations and goals. Okay, then I'll explain the two forms to you. To you. Conventional participation is um, traditionally voting, going to vote in your, um, yeah, in your state. And um, two other uh, forms of conventional participation is campaign, are campaign activity and communal activity. But um, I think voting is the most important. So the vote, you, you um, it's um, the voting race is decreasing and very very many people uh, vote just out of conscientiousness not to influence policy that um, says um, that uh, for example in Germany every four years you say okay am I going to vote to influence uh, my government so no I have to go to vote is it's a kind of um, yes I have to go to vote but um, you're not going to uh, vote to influence the parliament so voting seems to have no direct influence on policy. Then unconventional participation are demonstrations or protests or civil disobedience and so on. There are very many uh, various forms of unconventional participation. Maybe I'll explain civil disobedience. It's maybe not clear. Civil disobedience means um, yeah, acting against the law um, and non-violently because of ethical beliefs, yes. <clears throat> it's kind of ziviler Ungehorsam in Germany. So in the past, protest was often the last desperate act of the public. Today it's quite common and it remains a political instrument of minorities and repressed groups. <clears throat> and uh, unconventional participation seems to be more direct and seems to have visible influence on policy. So um, there's a diagram which I thought you might be, uh, you might find interesting, <coughs> which shows shows us the um, forms of um, yes, mainly uh, un um, unconventional participation. There you see, it's a uh, wide, it's very widespread. It uh, comes from a basic unorthodox political behavior to direct action to illegal action and um, even to violence. And <clears throat> so what can we do if voting seems to be ineffective and, and unconventional participation well, leads us maybe to jail? And uh, then we say that new and more efficient ways of participation have to be institutionalized. Okay, then um, we have to ask ourselves yeah, <clears throat> the people are frustrated, but are they really frustrated of democracy as a concept or government form? And then you could say, can say that um, the answer is a clear no, <clears throat> but the people are more uh, dissatisfied with current democratic practices. Okay, so, so what can we do with a nation full of frustrated and critical citizens? The political alienation must be stopped. So if you go voting a hundred times and nothing changes, you won't go to vote and you won't be interested in politics anymore. The uninformed citizens have to be picked up. Um, it's always hard to inform if you have no idea what to do. So we have to pick them up and uh, inform them, inform them by easily accessible information. And uh, their critical thinking has to be stimulated and supported. Critical thinking is very um, important. 
So new technologies have to be exhausted to create new stimulations for participation. So you saw that at the, um, yeah, at the television since the 50s. Everybody watched TV and if there's some kind of political issues in the TV, everybody's informed. So, yes. <clears throat> and you could, we can uh, state that fascina fascination for new media is a powerful motivation. That's maybe because we all sit in front of our computers every day. <laughs> Okay, so we have to ask ourselves if uh, new media is a kind of last resort. Okay, then I want to say briefly something about the internet and politics. <coughs> the internet and politics is an interactive process. You uh, sit in front of your uh, screen and you can um, participate actively. Television is only one way. Maybe television makers tell us uh, another thing, but television uh, is really one way. So everybody is a sender or has the chance to be a sender. There's no need for physical presence. And you have no temporal limits. You can go into the internet 24-7. There's no censorship, okay, in the ideal case. And um, we think that the internet has a great potential to realize direct democratic concepts. Okay, S any questions so far? Yes. Okay, I think you forgot a very important point concerning the conventional uh, methods mm -hmm. of taking part, of participating, uh, joining or founding a known political party. Ah, okay. And I think in Germany we have a very actual, uh, very recent uh, example that it works, the VSG. Yes, okay, thank you, okay. Maybe we'll add this later in our slides so that everybody can uh, read this later. Well, um, I wrote it just down for the discussion, for the discussion afterwards, and um, I think we will, we will be into that. Because okay. it's a very interesting point, because we, this is actually what we can do with uh, the technology we have, and it can really aid. So, uh, I just wrote it down, it's great. Another thing, don't you think it's a bit naive to believe that since the 50s, the situation the democratic situation got better because um, today if I watch TV, um, I think I'm getting less intelligent <laughs> because there's yes. um, so much shit on TV. Yes. And um, I think the broad mass... <laughs> <laughs> and I think the, bro the broad mass is getting even um, less political informed through yes. that. And sure, my um, what is it called? Um, my society where where I act, most people are informed, but um, the broad mass isn't really. Mm. There's <coughs> okay. I'll briefly briefly respond to this because um, maybe we should um, discuss really at the end. I, I noted it. Yeah. We'll, we'll okay. go into that at the end. We could everything okay? Okay. <coughs> we could uh, state that there's a split into um, intelligent people and really uninformed people in the media. But this is quite another point. So um, okay. Then um, maybe we'll discuss this later if you are okay with this. Okay, we've noted it. So then, oh, another pressing oh. one. Don't you think that um, the uh, frustration of the voters comes mainly that, especially in Germany, every important decision, with the one exception of the fall of the wall, um, is, has come from the top of the government and not from the bottom of the people? For example, um, the Hartz uh, IV debate, People went onto the streets in great masses and nothing changed. Mm -hmm. Like Cole said, if the dogs bark, who cares? Yes, we could um, say that um, demonstrating um, in the past um, always led to a kind of revolution. People went to street to um, have a revolution. Today, nearly, okay, it's a kind of, yes, it's not everybody, but very many, many people are demonstrating, but not to have a kind of revolution, but to uh, make reforms. 
it's kind of more common today. And this kind of trend, <coughs> and um, so this is, this is why it seems compared with the past situation of demonstrating, dem demonstrating today doesn't change anything. You, okay, does this, uh, is this okay as uh, an answer? Or okay. I think we'll pick that one up uh, for, for the end as well. Yes. I mean, we would love to discuss this because it's quite interesting what you said about it. Maybe, maybe one point to kind of hold back. I mean, I'll write it down. Otherwise, I will continue with the next part then. Yes. Okay, then it's Christiane's turn. Okay, let's, let's go a little bit into system theory and what we can make of it, because it's quite a universal instrument to think about nearly everything, as we will see. And um, basically the idea behind system theory is, um, like Aristotle said, uh, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And, well, so let's look what, what this whole is about. I mean, it's the definition of a system. And a system is a set of elements and their interrelations comprising a whole, such that the whole is more than the sum of its constituents. Well, constituents is just another word for the elements in the system. And there's one thing to note about the elements, because the elements of a system, they are systems as well. And this is more like a recursive definition of a system, but it, it really works if you think about it. And this whole that Aristotle um, noted some 2,000 years ago, um, that forms more in it, that is quite, it's, it's quite an, um, a finding, and this is called emergence. And emergence is something like that um, that cannot be explained by the constituents alone. And it's what, so um, the emergence must stem from the interrelations between the constituents. And one word on uh, systemical evolution. And any system to, you know, to be able to exist must uh, differentiate against the environment. And there's no other opportunity for the system than to interact with other systems. And interestingly, as the constituents are systems as well, this holds true for the constituents. Um, so the other way around, uh, the interaction of any systems uh, will lead to differentiation. It's, it's how it, how it uh, works, and you can see it in any physical system if you think about it. And such you can say that differentiation and systematical interaction, they are like hen and egg. You cannot actually distinguish them. Um, now it's a bit of information theory, and um, you can say that a sender never really can transmit a message as, as he meant it um, to the receiver. And you can split it up into um, that a sender actually creates potential information. And this is some sort of definition because um, you can just produce words or sentences and so on. And it's just a question, what does the receiver make of it? So it's a question, uh, how does the receiver interpret uh, my potential information? And this will be according to the receiver's own level of differentiation. Um, well, you can say by the knowledge or, or well, intelligence or whatever you may think of the receiver. And actually, the receiver will learn from and um, will learn by improving its ability to differentiate. And forget about the B at the end. Um, so you can always say that transmitted information, the actual transmitted information, is just a subset of the potential information that has been created. And you will always find reduction in such a process. So generally, um, this is a very simple. Uh, model of the communication uh, in the modern representative democracies, you will find that um, almost any political discussion takes place between representatives, and that's where uh, the criticism of um, lacking transparency comes in. Um, <coughs> actually, there are media reports back to the people, but that is very selective, and uh, the people can communicate with the representatives um, by just voting, or maybe by referendum, but that's quite seldom a case. So, we can actually see how 
this reduction of informational flow will will have an effect on that because um, yeah, like I, like I said, um, the voters in the system, they communicate by casting votes, mainly, and petitions are rather uncommon and other forms of um, direct participation in a conventional way. Um, the communication backed by the media, it's um, usually suited for the broad interest and um, those people with special interests and um, interest for special content, they must actively go around and search for that and that's quite a lot of work and so um, this, this step must be easier, I mean, to get to uh, the information you really want. And there's even more reduction in the communication between um, the people and the representatives, and actually within the communication of the representatives as well, because usually the information that you gather and that are really there, the potential information, it gets reduced. It's like a 49% no and a 51% yes, it will be reduced to a simple yes. And that's just a reduction of information and it takes place anywhere. And that's really bad if you want to see that information flow is really the key point to all of this. And this is a point where fuzzy logic actually helps. We will see a bit about that. So the information flow, um, if it's reduced, so from a systematical point of view, you will see that the interrelation between the elements is reduced within that system. And quite funny about this systematic view and system theory is that you can really apply to everything. I mean, you, it holds, of course, true for material systems, as any physicist will tell you. Um, and it becomes more and more clear that it, um, that it works even for states and for, for even psychological processes. And uh, like uh, states and international companies are interrelated systems. Um, uh, on the other way, they form, they form um, the constituents of a larger system, with an emergence, of course. Um, you can go into the states, which are constituent uh, of governmental organizations, non-governmental organizations, and companies, communities, and the people voting in them. And it's just a point of view, it's quite relative, everything. And um, you can go down to political parties, they are constituted of, um, of the people in it, and, and so on. And it's quite. It goes down to the level of atoms, and doesn't it? Okay, then take that one for. <laughs> do you want to state something? Okay, okay great. That so that would be cool. Okay, great. Um, yes, thanks. It's actually it's a good point. I mean, okay. As, as I said, there's fuzzy logic about this. What's what's behind it? I mean, fuzzy logic is nothing more. It's a sub. Um, it's a sub. Uh, well, yeah. How is it called? It, it's, it's a subdivision of a fuzzy set theory, actually, and. Um, Basically, it expands the Boolean logic we all know from a simple set of 0 and 1 to um, the whole interval of 0 to 1. So it's a much broader range. And um, if you think about it, there are so-called norms for relations between the elements in such sets. Like, um, you cannot really state um, a human is old or something like that. You will, you will have to be fuzzy about this because some are more old than others and so on. So. Uh, the Boolean logic usually fails with such problems. And on the other hand, if you have got localized decisions and you want to, you want to make sure that only those people who are concerned have a really highly weighted vote on it, you can put such a function as, as it's right there on the, on the side. Um, you can then just say, um, if you're very near to Berlin or something like that, um, you will have a high well, it's very true that you are near Berlin, so you have high weight in, in a decision. And um, by this way, you can, you can construct an, nearly anything about uh, those relations. And um, with those norms and relations, you can build very simple sets, actually, um, of, of messages. No, it's not messages, it's um, Aussagen. I just say in German because I just missed a word here. Um, it's just 
simple. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's expressions. There are simple expressions like um, if A and B or C, then D. It's nothing more like that. But um, they operate on fuzzy and changing input variables. And these systems, they are called expert systems. And you can do great things with that. Um, actually, your favorite washing machine does it. And um, there are a lot of technical uh, uses for that. And some companies run their whole production line on uh, fuzzy theory and um, this fuzzy logic. Um, and basically, if you make such norms and expert systems, um, these are pretty well subject to uh, political debate. You can debate how, how it's better um, to put the function you see there. You, you, could, you could shift the curve to the right or to the left or, or whatever you think is right. That could be part of uh, the political discussion and debate and put it on the vote. So I think there are some lessons learned from uh, the theory behind this. And to put it a little bit um, scientifically, you can say any sufficiently interrelated constituent has direct influence on the system as a whole. It's something you can learn from the system theory. And most people will know this as a butterfly principle. And butterflies wing flap will cause thunderstorms somewhere else in the world. And you can al also say that direct democracy really serves the individual in it, if it's under the, um, under the condition that it's highly interrelated into the system. Um, so to turn all this around, if in a state or a community the interrelation of people as constituents is reduced because uh, they just can vote every four years and uh, there's no communication back, um, their needs will less and less influence the system differentiation and evolution. Yeah, more lessons learned. Um, you shouldn't reduce all the votes you have and all the decisions you make just to a simple yes or no. You should remember what it actually was distributed like. And um, basically, this leads to, if you take them as variables into uh, your expert systems, that you can change them at any time. And also, these um, results, they actually are reusable. Because um, if they change from time to time and anybody can change their vote on something, um, you will have direct influence on any system that's actually in place. That's um, if you make expert systems from all that. It's, it's pretty neat, actually. There's, of course, lots of more to be learned from that, but I cannot think of anything right here, uh, anything more right here. And it would be part of discussion or something like that. But basically, one can say that one of the key findings is um, that information flow and communication is the key to system evolution. And um, the good news about all this is that we're already pretty good at communicating with the internet and so on. And at this point, I'm going to introduce some, some of the projects that I found on the internet and that were brought to me and that can be used for political participation. Um, one thing that I came across it is called Devotee, and that's the Debian voting engine. I mean, most of you will, heard, uh, will have heard of the Debian um, project. It's a Linux distribution that's, um, that's produced by a free um, developer uh, community, and they've got, uh, they have developed a voting engine, and you can find it at debian.org slash vote. And it's based on open communication over mailing lists that anybody can, um, can actually subscribe to. And even anybody without any restriction can make um, proposals. That's quite interesting about it. And to actually um, have this um, taken by the um, devotee engine, uh, you need to have supporters uh, within the roles of the developers who actually can vote on it. Uh, but basically, any, anybody can make a proposal. Um, then there will be an open discussion over the mailing lists for at least two weeks, and then the proposer can any time call for a vote if you think it's fit. And in the end, only developers are elective, and um, it's quite okay because you need to have some sort of uh, limit to the people voting to this because it's a very, a very special project. It's just the Debian Linux project, and so it's, it's quite okay to not have anybody vote on it. Um, basically, they work on the contortion method for the candidate voting. Uh, I don't think I will go into that, just note it if you don't. Um, 
you can look it up in the internet what it's actually about. It's like um, a system for uh, how to how to get results from the voting. Uh, there's another interesting project that uh, was brought to me by mail. It's uh, called uh, the Democratic Experience. It's demx.org, and they've got quite a new influ um, quite a new way to go about this. They say just ask everybody on everything and see what it's going to be, and anybody in the system who takes place um, can open a vote or they call a question and. Anybody can add answers to these questions. Um, and at any time, you can change your vote into what you ever think is, is good in the course of the discussion. And um, in the end, you will, you will have um, a system that is in a flux and that will produce um, the voting um, results just as they, well, well, as they develop over time. You can, you can see them changing, actually. And they too use the condorcent method for um, making something from those votes. And there's one specialty to all this because all the, ex uh, all the discussion that is needed for um, decision finding and for voting and so on, they're external. You have to arrange something over mailing lists and forums and so on. And of course, there are much more projects. I just don't have time to search for them and I don't have all the time to present them right here. There are plugins for PHP BB and there are, there are really lots of things going on and it's quite interesting to look at them. Um, let's go into some techniques that we already have that can aid our communication in political systems. It's just the RSS feeds or Atom feeds or whatever you are using because they make you and they give you the ability to subscribe for proposals and discussion threads and votes and whatever whatever you like. I mean, according to your expertise, if you're good at uh, mathematics, you will go to the statistic people or something like that. Or if you're good at, um, well, I mean, at healthcare, you will go into that sector and just take the information you really want and it will come to you actually. And that's a great deal, I think. Um, well, what you need for this is a proper tagging. I mean, uh, usually you just um, get the RSS free from a blog and you get everything in, but it n needs to be properly tagged so you can actually choose what information comes to you. Um, okay, uh, RSS feeds can be very perfect within combination with the slash dot principle, which I will tell you on the next slide. Um, to minimize the amount of text, uh, text you have to digest. And just, we will see in the next slide. And um, what is very interesting about this is the, um, the point that you don't need to be physically um, present at some discussion rooms or whatever, whatever uh, uh, the actual politics today take place in the Bundestag or wherever. Um, you can do your politics in the evenings and free time and just just a bit of politics, but if you have lots of people doing a bit, you will end up in having more. That's, that's my thesis on this. So what's about the slash dot principle? Uh, slash dot, it's uh, www slash dot dot org. I mean, most of you will know this. It has a very advanced discussion rating on it. And only those postings above your personal threshold um, are actually displayed directly. And you have to click through to all the postings that are below your threshold. And all the information is there. I mean, and the people can tell the most stupid things in there. And it's quite funny to see uh, that the mass of the people reading this are actually able to distinguish between good postings and bad postings. And good and bad, I mean, you might see it in the Heise Forum, usually means, um, usu usually means yeah, that's my opinion, and no, that's not my opinion. And um, there's no good in going through a discussion just um, slashing around with opinions. So if you look at slash dot, it looks quite different. You will see the informative postings up there and not those who are bragging for opinion and so on. And so this supports the thesis that the mass, actually, if you let them vote on something, they will find something okay about this. And I, and I think, and this is actually my personal proposal, that most people, even the undereducated and so on, when, when they take part in discussion, they can distinguish between um, good discussion and bad discussion, and between good arguments and bad arguments. 
Um, okay, and the slash dot principle, uh, it's quite expandable if you think about it. They are quite uh, simple right now. They've got informative, funny, and what was, I think, one or two more categories. Um, you, can, you can put much more categories into that, like the spin doctrines, like making uh, opinions and so on. And uh, like expert level, if you have to go into a higher education, go through a higher education to follow the discussion and so on. Um, you can extend it as well by a proper tagging system that it right now lacks. That means you can have all the tags you want and you can, you can just tag those tags that you're really interested in. They've got something like that on a higher level. You can, uh, they've, got, um, they've got branches of the whole slash dot system like uh, techniques and communication and uh, social stuff and, and so on. Um, but you can make it even on a lower basis if you are discussing um, with many, many people, you will want a proper <laughs> tagging system. Okay, I have to hurry up a bit. Um, Okay, what's, what's about the slash top principle is the personal preference for scoring. You can just say, hey, I want all the expert level discussions because I'm highly educated or I just want the funny ones because I want to laugh in the evening. So that's a great thing about slash dot. So there, there's more that we already have. It's a PGP and a new PGP, the open implementation. It's just for digital encryption and signatures. And you can actually use it for a secure cast of votes. So that if you want not anybody to have uh, the ability to vote, you will, just, um, you will just accept those votes which are signed uh, with a key that you trust. And um, you can actually um, make this, uh, you can make partisan involvement uh, through a centralized sig signature system. That means if you want to be able um, to, to vote in a discussion or within a party or within your community or whatever system you're in, you will just have to get the right signature on your key and there you go and then you can take part. Um, and there's one more way to build this um, involvement. It's a web, web of trust. I mean, if I trust you for my party, I will sign your key and then you're in. Or maybe um, you need two signatures or whatever. You can think about it. You can build webs of trust and um, you can build trust chains. And that's quite interesting because um, if there's any misuse about this, um, you will see where in the trust chain it happened. If there's a really, um, maybe you have 10,000 people in such a web of trust and you will only have five or 10 people uh, who really want to do bad things with it and go um, and play around with it, you will actually be able to trace it back and cut the trust chain right there where you think it's a problem. You can make that a debate. So what are the problems with the modern communication? Um, basically, if you have anybody discussing on anything, um, you will have non-experts discuss with experts and that will usually go very wrong. But those expert systems can partially solve that. I mean, uh, those experts uh, will be able to build pretty cool and pretty nifty expert systems and you will just put the votes in there that are cast by the people um, that are not so very much involved into the higher level uh, decisions. But in the end, it's, everything is open. I mean, it's, it's built in in such a system yeah, everybody can see anything. I mean, you could start trying with encryption, but usually that will fail anywhere, uh, somewhere. And this uh, transparency, it might help manipulation. Um, on the other hand, you have the ability to make network analysis on it and gather right quite a lot of information on the people in there. Um, and the built-in transparency it might be a very big disadvantage in a generally secretive environment. DRM might help with that, um, but the interesting point is that all this will cease with the prevalency of those open systems. I mean, if anybody is open, there will be not much, um, not much an advantage to the openness, uh, to the secretiveness. Um, basically, there's a technical, technical dependability. Um, like on the internet infrastructure and the computers we have, and we inherit all the problems from that, uh, like denial of service, and you will have to really look for fallbacks and redundancy in case of the people are coming with their botnets and just want to make a denial of service on you, and there your political system goes. It's quite, it's a bit tricky, I guess. Um, actually, in the technical stuff requires internet access and right now some decent technical skills. And in the end, it's a lot of work to implement a really usable system. 
So what to do? Let's start small scale. I mean, make your local CCC um, act in such a way and with such a system, or make your, make your party that you think it's good, make it based on some systems that you think that work. Use it for your local club or small company or your interesting group or wherever you think it's fit. Let's just play around with it. I mean, it has to start somewhere. And then just grow bigger by creating new interrelated systems for it. I mean, just many small systems, if they interrelate, they form a big system with, well, some big emergence. I mean, we will see what that's going to be. So maybe this is also described by the term grassroots revolution. I don't know. Well, and in the end, we would like to say thank you for attending this year. I mean, lots of people here. Thanks a lot for coming. And I've just put here some literature, and you will be able to get these uh, slides from from the from the pages to this talk. And about fuzzy set theory, I mean, and expert system, just to ask your favorite search engine or your university about some lectures or something like that. And well, if you would like to stay, we would have time a little time for discussion. Thanks a lot. Maybe um, is the next lecture person here already or? Okay, then maybe we can have a s short discussion. So please. Well, one problem I see with your approach to de democracy and fuzzy democracy is demographics in our highly developed countries. We have a very large uh, number of growing old people and um, the normal uh, democratic processes don't uh, grasp them really because uh, the older people get the more they tend to vote in favor of a status quo and so even if we have a highly informed uh, community that doesn't mean they vote in favor of logical or uh, to the favor of the whole community well, actually, that's a point that I was quite surprised um, by when you look at Slashdot. Um, it, there seems to be some emergence from these systems that actually make it work. I mean, it's not really explainable. We have to try it out. It's a good point about this person. But and that's also where wh the old people are also a group of people who have to pick up and um, um, for which the um, government is really responsible because uh, the government is not only responsible for your welfare, but it's also responsible for your um, autonomous um, dis decision making. And this means it has to act, um, provide information. And maybe it could be, there, there could be courses for old people uh, explaining computers and so on. And this is, we think, also one point where uh, um, a state is really responsible. But one last comment uh, to the Slashdot community you have a very specific group of people in Slashdot and you can uh, just say we have a, a broad uh, grasp of the whole um, community as such. It's a very special technical community. Um, that, that's approach. You start small with a, with a small interest group like your local CCC and so on. And if you start small, you will automatically have those people involved who are really interested. And if you make that approach, you would, you would not end up with a system like a whole state suddenly acting on, on such an open system probably wouldn't work. But if you start small, you, you will just have that like slashed out. I mean, maybe even sharper. Yes. Okay, I just want to um, make a quick notice. Yes. I was hoping for more advanced examples, actually. Um, and Hard I to just do. want to, to bring some more. Uh, I want to draw your attention to mysociety.org, which is really very, very important. It's an organization in the UK uh, which are doing great things uh, democracy-wise with the web. For example, pledgebank.com, which you should really know. What? Uh, just have a look at mysociety.org. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. We, we are just and thankful for all these hints, by yes, the way. Yes, and another addition I want to make is the concept of liquid democracy, which is mm -hmm. also very important. And we are still looking for a, a real good technical implementation of this. So great. that's just two remarks. Maybe, maybe one more um, here. Um, I would like to invite anybody, for uh, everybody here who's, who wants to make and discuss on this or whatever, uh, into the lounge above, maybe in about an hour. Uh, if you find time, it would be great to come there. I mean, I will be there. 
Will you be there? Yes. I okay. Think so. Because it's it's really great to have this discussion here. I mean, um, just a technical just a technical comment. Um, if you use uh, um, open uh, PGP or um, something like that for e-voting, um, my vote will be public and it will not be anonymous. And um, th I think that's a bit of a problem. You can't use PGP for um, building an e-vote system. Well, maybe you don't have to uh, use your private key. Maybe you can go to your local civil service and get a kind of anonymized key. <coughs> so, yes. But this is right. There are very, very many... Um, this is one of the big disadvantages in e-voting. So... Well, you can, in the end, you can decide if you implement a system, if you make all this information public or not, if, or if you are going to make it, um, take it private so that, that only the people directly involved can access it. I mean, that's a question of in implementation, but in the end, um, that's just a problem with it. It's um, the inherent transparency to all this. But in the end, if almost everything is transparent, it, well, of course, there's, there's a problem to this, but maybe it's more important to have a working democracy. I mean, you have to weigh it. What's more important to you? Um, I think I personally would choose the better democracy in that case. Yes, but, but it's um, also important to have a, an anonymous vote. Yes. In, in, in the yes, but not with PGP only. Of course, there's more to it. Okay, I would, I would say let, let's free the room for the next speech. Yes. Um, and maybe, we could maybe in an hour up above yeah. in the lounge and would be happy to see you there. Thanks.